Um, first of all, my conflict of interest is I support Gary. <laughs> I am not anti-religion, I am not anti-veganism, vegetarianism or anything else. I'm just anti the people who are getting into our dietary guidelines, creating rule books and hammering my husband. So I want to let you in on a little secret. I believe that the dietary guidelines have become plant-based vegetarian rule books. They have to be. Why else would Gary be reported, investigated for two and a half years, and subsequently given a lifelong, non-appellable ban to stop him talking to his patients and the wider community simply for talking about the health benefits of low carbohydrate, healthy fat principles. A ruling that states, even if LCHF becomes accepted best practice, you can never talk about it. If you consider the word guideline, it means a general rule. It means a principle or advice. To me, this explanation sounds interpretive. It sounds flexible and negotiable. But in reality, our dietary and health guidelines are restrictive rule books. They're fiercely protected by associations and regulatory bodies. Just ask Gary, Tim Noakes and Jen Elliott. The low carb thought leaders around the world know what it takes great strength to challenge the nutrition paradigm. Their intentional defiance, sprinkled with humility, enables them to speak out and tell the truth about the health benefits of LCHF, keto and fasting. After years of feeling like he was simply band-aiding sick care, Gary was so excited when he found LCHF, which for him was the missing piece of the health jigsaw. He wanted to talk and debate the science with his peers, sharing the health benefits he was seeing in himself and in his patients. He never lost his enthusiasm for helping people take back control of their health. I felt sad and frustrated for him as I watched Gary talk about the science behind LCHF over and over again. But the healthcare profession rarely listened and certainly not within the hierarchy or the bureaucracy levels he'd hoped for. So I started asking why. Why was the low fat, high carbohydrate doctrine being so religiously defended. Maybe it's never been about the science at all. We know there are vested interests wanting to maintain the status quo. Both the food and pharmaceutical industries have helped shape the dietary and health guideline rule books for decades. They've been funding research and sponsoring continuing medical education and dietetic education. But there had to be more to it than just this. And I found the answers I was looking for buried in the pages of history. It's been a really fascinating journey trying to find out not only when, but how and why nutrition science got so unraveled. Interestingly, our plant-based dietary guidelines appear to have evolved from a temperance and religious ideology that promotes vegetarianism. So how did I manage to connect the temperance movement, vegetarianism, religious ideology to Gary's case. Let me explain. I couldn't work out why the highest profile nutrition expert in the Southeast Asia Pacific region and one of the most recognised nutrition experts in the world became involved in Gary's APRA investigation. Now while I think Gary is incredible, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he's incredible, he is, um, he's an orthopaedic surgeon in Launceston. We've got 120,000 people, catchment area, and at the time that he was reported, he had about 5,000 people following him on Facebook, which is hardly letting the world know about what he was talking about. So when questioned, why was this nutrition expert brought in in Gary's case, even the medical board could not tell us where this man had appeared from. He just simply appeared. So the expert witness in Gary's case, Professor Mark Walkest, promotes vegetarianism. His textbook is the recommended one for many nutrition courses. And when we spoke to our dietitians at, in Tasmania afterwards, they hadn't even realised when they'd learnt from this book that they hadn't studied meat. You know, the references to meat causes cancer, mad cow disease, all these things, because education is siloed. And so by the time you slip through a, an education course, you don't even realise you've missed out on meat. So, 
He's also associated with Australia's Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Cereal Food Company, and he continues to have close relationships with the Dietitians <coughs> Association of Australia, who are also happen to be entrenched with the processed food industry. None of this was declared as a conflict of interest during Gary's investigation, and when we supplied proof, it was dismissed. While it began to become clear who wanted Gary silenced, we never imagined for a minute that it was actually for recommending healthy saturated fats and including meat in the diet. The vegetarian vegan movement is tied up with religious ideology and they become a very powerful lobby group. When you challenge a belief or an ideology, the people you question will defend their belief religiously and they will never back down. Generational education then becomes an issue because once beliefs and ideology shape education and it is taught over and over, it becomes the gospel truth. The Eastern origins of vegetarian, vegetarianism come from Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism and other Eastern religions who have a respect for animals based on the central role of animals in their food cycle and their environment. And I have to say, I agree with it. Most Eastern religions generally eat the produce from animals and none exclude meat or fish in entirety. It is worth noting that the Eastern vegetarians are not immune to health issues and their ever increasing rates of obesity and diabetes prove that. The origins of abstaining from meat eating in Western society was more to do with promoting temperance. It was about dampening impure thoughts and lustful aggressive behaviours in a biblical sense than protecting animals. The UK Bible Christian Church was one of the key groups promoting vegetarianism and temperance in the early 1800s after Reverend William Coward came out as a vegetarian and he insisted his congregation did too. And that was in 1809. Inspired followers included American itinerant preachers Sylvester Graham of Graham Crackers and William Metcalf, who along with Dr. William Alcott went on to co-found the American Vegetarian Society in 1850. Sylvester Graham and his fellow health reformers were described as blending religion, science, philosophy and politics to establish a scientific rationale for vegetarianism. So it wasn't people's health, it was them trying to prove it. They believed that Americans were plagued by disease because of immoral behaviour and overstimulation. Emphasis was placed on a vegetarian diet without meat or dairy, sexual restraint, and a balance between rest, exercise, and cleanliness. Vegetarianism, vegetarianism was considered the original God-appointed diet of humankind, and they promoted the idea that vegetarianism should become the basis of all reform, whether civil, social, moral, or religious. A very powerful group. Ellen G. White was one of four founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1844, also promoting temperance and vegetarian health reform. Gary explains the history of the Seventh-day Adventism and the church's reach today in far more detail than I can go to in my talk um, on, a, on his talk from the CrossFit Games, which is linked to my website, isupportgary.com. In summary, between 1848 and 1915, Ellen G. White had over 2,000 visions on health reform and prophecy, including her angels' messages, on the devastating effects of tobacco, alcohol, and drugs such as tea and coffee. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. The term meat gives you cancer stems from her visions in 1864, and that care of health is a religious duty with medical evangelism, the right arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The vision started when Ellen G. White was just 17 years old. She was an incredibly prolific writer and her writings have become the teachings of the church. The problem is that the Seventh-day Adventist followers have been working hard to prove her visions are correct over time and even their scientific research has been driven to prove these beliefs. As it turns out, the origins of the current vegetarian guidelines have their beginnings tied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The American Dietetic Association was co-founded in October 1917 by dietitian Lena Frances Cooper. Lena Cooper was a protege of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg at the Battle Creek Sanitarium 
Michigan. She was a vegetarian and she practiced the teachings and ideology of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She became a dietitian in the US Army in 1918, the very first dietitian, and influential in US defense policy when she was appointed to the US Surgeon General's office after the war. She was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium School of Home Economics, and she wrote the textbooks for the dietetic and nursing programs around the world for 30 years. And we have a copy of one of her original textbooks. Lena Cooper was the voice of dietetics for decades. Vegetarianism was finally achieved within the American Dietetic Association, now known as the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, in 1988. Of the nine reviewers of the position of the American Dietetic Association on Vegetarian Diets, nine of them had vested interests in a positive outcome. Eight of the nine reviewers were vegetarian, while the other person was tied to the processed food industry, which is the International Life Science Institute. And five of the reviewers were from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including Kathleen Zolber as a past president of the ADA. The birthplace of the cereal industry was definitely in Battle Creek, Michigan. In the early 1900s, there were around 100 cereal companies, mostly started by members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and many merging over time. The best known to all of us, of course, would be Kellogg's, and it's ranked even now as one of the wealthiest food producers in the world. It's a publicly owned company, whereas Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Company in Australia, operating throughout Australasia, is wholly owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As a church-owned food company, they pay no taxes. 16 years after a vision where an, where an angel told Ellen G. White that she saw a Seventh-day Adventist publishing house in Australia, Ellen arrived with her son, Elder William C. White, Merritt Kellogg, the stepbrother of John Harvey and William Keith Kellogg, and Edward Halsey, a baker from Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium. Their plans were to establish the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Sydney Adventist Hospital, Avondale College, the Science Publishing Company, and they wanted to reproduce the Kellogg serial model, but this time have the church own it and the profits. The Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Company remains one of Australia and New Zealand's biggest and most trusted companies. As you saw, Gary got his present yesterday, this week, Big Box. The plant-based food guidelines have done their business model no harm. In fact, it has allowed them to involve themselves in ongoing research into the health benefits of vegetarianism into health education, and to continue their medical evangelism around the world, funded by donations, this keeps jumping, funded by donations, tithe, and the profit made from processed food production. Ellen G. White achieved a lot in her decade in Australia, and her influence has continued to grow. She returned to the US in 1900. What is the Seventh-day Adventist Church influencing now? Well, the Australasian Research Institute, which sounds incredibly important, is based at the Sydney Adventist Hospital. It's positioned to facilitate, coordinate, and fund development research within the Adventist healthcare setting. Its member organisations include the Adventist Healthcare Limited, Avondale College, owned by the church, and the Australian Health and Nutrition Association, which is actually sanitarium. The Lifestyle Medicine Institute, CHIP, or the Complete Health Improvement Program, was started in the US. In 2014, Avondale College signed an MOA with the Lifestyle Medicine Institute, a company of the Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing, for an agreement to secure Avondale College as the lead research unit for all research relating to CHIP internationally. Sanitarium CEO, Kevin Jackson, is also the chairman, sorry, it's jumping, chairman of the board for the Lifestyle Medicine Institute based in Loma Linda, California. And then we have the tangled web of lifestyle medicine, which is really complex to go into. But the Australasian <coughs> Society of Lifestyle Medicine includes medical and allied health practitioners, public health professionals, educators and researchers, all advancing lifestyle medicine with no mention of vegetarianism. They are part of a global alliance of lifestyle medicine and you can become board certified or do a fellowship in the lifestyle medicine. I love this quote by Troy Stapleton. Nutrition is the only science where those who consider evolution a fringe and those who don't mainstream. Bizarre. 
Seems to me the plant-based mantra we hear over and over is really a cereal and grain-based doctrine for the processed food industry, promoting soy and fake meats, which is essentially anti-red meat and dairy. If you hear the Mediterranean diet touted by Lifestyle Medicine or the DAA, you can rest assured their version does not include saturated animal fats, but instead promotes the olive oil industry, which just so happens to be a major sponsor. I believe that the temperance movement and vegetarian ideology have been driving our guidelines and shaping our rule books for 150 years. So let's take a quick look at the evolution of the dietary guidelines. When did whole grains become the sacred cow of nutrition? And where did the meat go? In the 1940s, nearly half the food guideline was meat and dairy. In the 1950s, we still had dairy and meat up at the top. By 58, the cereals were becoming a bit more obvious. And by 1979, meat started drifting down the page and bread and cereal were climbing up. In 1992, the food pyramid that many of us would have grown up with reflects the demonization of saturated fats from meat and dairy following the review and acceptance of the vegetarian position paper of the American Dietitians Association in 1888. In fact, look at the explosion of cereal and grain products with a recommendation of up to six to 11 servings per day. In the US, the MyPlate guide cannot even bring itself to mention the word meat. Instead, it calls it protein, which will include legumes, fake meats, and the soy products. Here's our current Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. Red meat and full fat dairy are barely there, and as Gary says, you almost need a search, party to, a search and rescue party to go and find them. But there's plenty of processed cereals and grains, soy, fake meat, fake dairy, and fake oils, planted all over our Guide to Healthy Eating. The nutrition rule books have been shaped and manipulated to become plant-based. The fear of meat has come from temperance and religious ideology and hugely influenced the visions of a young woman and the vested research to prove those visions. This has never been about the science, and now that we've become aware of the rules, we can play the game. Gary and I are vegetarian. We choose to supplement the diet with real food. <laughs> the processed food industry and the Seventh-day Adventist Church have been educating health professionals for 100 years and failing to declare their conflict of interest. And that's 100 years too long. Sometimes we have to take a step back from the seriousness of life and the pressures and frustrations we feel. This whole vegetarian rule book thing needs a bit of a poke. And seeing Gary's description of his version of vegetarianism gave me an idea. Some of you may be aware I recently sang on Facebook. And hey, I'm on stage with a microphone and an audience. Oh, you missed me. <laughs> and I will have all the words up on the screen, so please feel free to sing along. The syllables work perfectly to the tune of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and I've brought Gary's earmuffs. <laughs> we are carno over lacto pesco polo vegetarian even though the sound of it is something quite contrarian we know the guidelines don't like meat and nor does sanitarium carno over lacto pesco polo vegetarian dum diddle 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 dum diddle die dum diddle 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 dum diddle lie he started talking benefits of low carb healthy fat the daa didn't like it and he copped apra's wrath but then one day he sang a tune in line with regulation. The catchy tune that brings to mind a ta passionate Tasmanian. Carno over lacto pesco polo vegetarian. Forget low fat and high carb crap and eating flexitarian. The plant based talk of soy and grain are quite authoritarian. Carno over lacto pesco polo vegetarian. It's never been about the science. 